Sparta economies has to do with the fact that in a Barta economy, production for exchange takes place. It is always unproblematic if, insofar if we produce something just because we want to use it. All we have to do is to decide, is it worth my effort to produce what I myself want to use afterwards? That's no problem. But in a barter economy, we only partly produce for our own use. We also produce in order to use the things that we produce to exchange for other things that other people produce. Now, what problem arises here when we produce something for exchange purposes? The answer is this. We can only exchange one good for another good, my goods for your goods, if two accidents happen at the same time. That is, you must have what I want, and I must have what you want. We call it a double coincidence of wants must be in existence. If you have what I want, but I don't have what you want, then obviously we cannot trade. So it is necessary that two accidents happen at the same time. You must have what I want, and I must have what you want. Then people who have produced for exchange purposes can directly exchange their goods. If you assume that in the world there is absolutely no uncertainty that is, everybody can exactly predict what other people will produce, what sort of, what they want in exchange for the things that they produce and so forth. If everybody were absolutely certain about the future, then nobody would ever produce anything in vain. I would only produce something because I know she wants what I have produced and she will produce exactly what I want. And we both can predict exactly how many of those things she wants for how many things of what I produce. No problem. If there is certainty in the world, then no problems arise. But of course, we do not live in a world that is certain. There exists uncertainty in the world. We do not know exactly what we want, what we'll be producing, we do not know what you will be producing. We will not know how much you like this or that or change your opinion about how much you like this and how much you like this. There exists uncertainty in the world. And as we will see, uncertainty is a fundamental reason for the fact that something like money comes into existence at all. What is the problem that arises because of uncertainty? I have produced something for exchange. I do not want to use it myself. I want to sell it and get something else for it. But somehow I do not find a person who wants exactly what I have and has exactly what I want. What do I do in such a situation? I have no need for it myself. I produced it for exchange purposes but I cannot directly exchange it. What do I do in such a situation? Now, in such a situation, it is entirely sufficient if some person makes a very trivial discovery. Not all goods that are produced in a barter economy are equally marketable. The marketability of goods is nothing else but the fact that some goods are frequently sold and exchanged in markets. Lots of people want these goods. And other goods are less frequently traded in markets. Um, let's say apple, lots of people want apples. So apples would be a highly marketable good. Very few people want fish fish would then be a less marketable good. 
So the various goods that are traded have different degrees of marketability. Some of them, lots of people want them at lots of times, and others, a few people want them uh, occasionally. So what a person has to do first is nothing else but make this very simple discovery. Let's say one bright person discovers not all goods are equally marketable. Some are more marketable and others are less marketable. Then he discovers, I cannot trade directly what I want to trade for things that somebody else has to produce, because the double coincidence of once is absent. Is absent. Um, give you an example. Let's say I have produced apples, and I want for my apples, I want eggs. Uh, but the egg producer does not want apples, uh, he wants pears. In that case, obviously, I cannot directly trade with the apple person. Um, but what I can do is this. I can try to find someone who is willing to take my apples if he has something that is even more marketable than my own apples. I'll make it clearer. Let's say I'm the fish seller, and I, as I said, fish is not that marketable. Um, and I have difficulties getting what I want for my fish. So now all I have to do is I have to find someone who wants fish. And he has something to sell that I do not personally want, but this good that he sells for the fish is more marketable than the fish itself. So let's say I hate apples, but I want to get rid of fish. There is the apple seller who is willing to buy the fish from me. I do not buy the apples because I like apples. As a matter of fact, I have an allergy against apples. What is the reason why I trade with this guy? The reason is apples are more marketable than fish. And what is the advantage that I gain, even if I personally hate apples, by trading my fish for his apples, is, of course, that the higher degree of marketability of apples now allows me to take these apples and exchange the apples for those things that I really want. Let's say my ultimate goal is I want eggs. It is easier to use apples as a highly marketable good to get eggs than it is to use fish to get eggs. A more marketable good can be used more easily to get those things that I ultimately want. What happens now to the degree of marketability of apples? Again, recall, initially we assumed that apples were a highly marketable good. That's why I demanded them, even though I personally did not like apples, did not want to consume them at all. I neither wanted to use them as a consumer good, nor did I want to use them as a producer good. I only took the apples because I expected I can turn around easily and sell my apples for whatever I want. What happens to the degree of marketability of apples once one person does this? The answer is the degree of marketability of apples increases even further. All people who like apples still like apples. That made them marketable in the first place. Plus there's one guy, myself, who demanded apples for a different purpose, different purpose, not to be used as a producer good, not to be used as a consumer good, but to be used as a medium of exchange, something that facilitates future exchange. Um, so obviously, then the degree of marketability of apples becomes even higher. Now. What happens next is that other people make the same type of observation. And they don't even have to be as bright anymore as the first person had to be. Because now it becomes easier for them to make the same observation. They cannot 
exchange directly, they have produced something for exchange purpose, are stuck. What do they do? Now they, all they do is just, all I have to do is to get rid of whatever I want to get rid of and acquire something for it that has a higher degree of marketability than the thing that I give away. And if possible, of course, acquire something that has the highest degree of marketability. And then you have, over sooner or later, you have a convergence. That is, all people begin, once they are in the situation where they cannot exchange directly, begin to demand goods to be used for the purpose of a medium of exchange, to be used for the purpose of reselling them in order to get what we really want. And then once people begin to imitate this practice, then we have very quickly what's called a common medium of exchange. All people more or less begin to use the same type of good for the same type of purpose Namely, this is the medium that makes acquiring whatever I want to acquire as easy as possible because it has the highest degree of marketability. And then we speak of this particular good as a money. Money is the most easily saleable of all commodities. If you look if whatever you have among your goods that you own and you try to sell whatever your coat or your pen uh, or your glasses or your jewelry you might find some people who are willing to uh, to trade this stuff but what is the good for which you find the widest acceptance which is the most easily saleable of all commodities and the answer that's money. Money is always easy to sell, so to speak. Uh, all other things are far more difficult to sell. Once we have a common medium of exchange in existence, then this problem that existed in barter, that we sometimes cannot really get what we want immediately, disappears. All we have to do is sell our goods, whatever it is that we have produced for money, the most marketable of all goods, and then use money, the most marketable of all goods, in order to acquire what we ultimately want. So it solves a fundamental problem. Let me also explain that another fundamental problem is immediately solved once a common medium of exchange comes into existence. I will say, have a few more things to say about what types of goods are selected for this purpose, but I will delay this for a while. If we produce something for exchange, and not because we want to use what we produce for our, ourselves. Then the problem arises that, of course, we do not want to waste resources. I don't want to just spend a huge amount of producing something and then get very little for what I have produced. We call this cost accounting. In your daily lives, you do that day in and day out. Cost accounting is we have prices for our input and we have prices for our output. I produce something. In order to produce it, I need certain things that go into whatever I produce, raw materials, whatever is land, labor, and so forth. And for this, for this input, we have prices. And then we produce something out of this input, and this output is also sold for money, also in terms of prices. And what do we want to achieve is obvious. We want to make sure that Breaking this in dollars, let's say, 
that if the prices for the input were $10, If for my inputs I had to just pay ten dollars, and then and said I bake a cake and use eggs and milk and flour to bake the cake, all the ingredients cost ten dollars, and then let's say I can sell my cake for eight dollars. What do I then know? You can't do that for very long. This is a lousy business. You make a loss. The input is actually more valuable in terms of money than what I produce. On the other hand, if I would get $18 for my cake, then I have produced something that was initially less valuable and transformed it in some, into something that was more valuable. Every producer wants, of course, to produce something that is more valuable than what went into the product and want to avoid making losses. Now, Go back to a barter economy. Can somebody who produces in a barter economy for exchange purposes determine whether he produced efficiently with profits or whether he produced inefficiently, made losses? And the answer is, in a barter economy, we cannot determine this. Why can't we determine it in a barter economy? Because we have incommensurable units. Look, you cannot add eggs and flour and milk and butter and labor and then say if we combine these things and produce a cake out of it, the cake is more valuable than the eggs, the flour, the butter and the labor. Why can't we say that? The answer is there are no units we can, you cannot compare apples and oranges and eggs and shoes and whatever it is. They have no common denominator. What makes it possible that we can say that the eggs, the flour, the butter and so forth were less valuable than the cake that resulted from combining these things is because we can reckon all of these items in terms of something else. We have a common denominator for all of them. The eggs can be expressed in terms of money, because they are bought and sold against money. The butter can be reckoned in terms of money. The flour can be reckoned in terms of money. And because of this, we can add these items together. And then everything is sold. And this is again done against money. And because of that, we can only perform this operation that seems to be very elementary, very primitive, but absolutely essential for everyone who produces for other people. Only because we have a common denominator and because we have a common medium of exchange, everything is sold and bought against money. Only because of that can we determine did we produce efficiently or did we not produce efficiently. Without money, in a barter economy, no rational economic calculation is possible. Only with money prices for all items can we do this task. Let me just go astray for a moment to make you aware of the utmost importance of this very primitive insight, so to speak. We do need money in order to perform money for input prices and for output, for our output, in order to engage in the economic calculation. One of the most important discoveries in the 20th century was by economist Ludwig von Mises, who analyzed what various socialists had made in terms of proposals, how the world should be organized, how socialism should work. And Mises discovered that somehow these people had all fantasies about how socialism worked and made them aware of a very simple problem. He pointed out, look, under socialism, you cannot engage in economic calculation. And what he meant was socialism in this regard 
has the same problem that we have in the barter economy and that can only be solved if money exists. What was his argument? What he pointed out is this. Under socialism, all factors of production, land, factories, machinery, and so forth, are allegedly owned by the state. There's no private ownership of factors of production. Now, if there is no private ownership of factors of production, then what cannot possibly come into existence? Land is then not sold and bought in markets, because how can one entity sell or buy something to itself? There is no stock market under socialism because all factories and so forth are owned by the state, by this one entity. There are no real estate prices. So what is then the problem under socialism? Under socialism, even if we assume that you have prices for all the consumer goods that are sold and bought in the market, what is lacking under socialism is prices for the input factors. There are no prices for land. There are no prices for factories. Uh, there are no prices for houses, uh, for office buildings. Nothing. There are no prices such as this. What can we then not determine under socialism? Whether we produce efficiently, that is, whether we turn something that was less valuable into something that is more valuable, which is the purpose of all production, or we turn something that was more valuable into something that was less valuable, which we want to avoid under all circumstances. So the primitive insight that I just explained to you has tremendously important applications. The application is that socialism, calculation, economic calculation under socialism is impossible. Socialism, because of this, is an utterly chaotic system. It is not more planned economy, it is completely unplanned. It's just chaos. You need, in order to do this, money prices for input factors, real estate prices, stock market prices, uh, prices for machinery and all the rest of it, in order to determine whether you produce efficiently or not. Now, I want to say a few things about the nature of, of money and what sort of commodities are selected as money. The first and most fundamental insight about money the thing that almost, even almost all monetary economists get wrong. But you have to understand that it's very easy to understand. Once you have understood that basic insight, you are already far advanced over most of these TV commentators and smart professors that talk about monetary affairs. It's the following insight. Consumer goods and producer goods, as compared to money, have one utterly important difference. When we ask the question about consumer goods, what would be the best amount of consumer goods to have? Then the answer would be quite easy. Would also, the more we have, the better it is. Um, when you ask what would be the optimal quantity of producer goods, what would be the best quantity of producer goods to have, the answer is just the same, because producer goods, after all, are useful in order to produce consumers. The more producer goods we have, the better we are off. Now the question, is that also true for money? Is that also true for the common medium of exchange? And the answer is decisively no. Why is that no? Again, recall what money does. Money is not used as a consumer good. We do not eat it. 
it does not give us satisfaction in the way as a sandwich gives us satisfaction. It is also not used as a producer good. We do not produce anything out of money. The sole purpose, the sole function of money is it is the most easily saleable commodity. It facilitates exchange. It's not a producer good, it is not a consumer. Now, in order to explain why we cannot say the more money we have, the better off we are, in the same way as we can say that about consumer goods and producer goods, is to just engage in a little thought experiment. So let's say the angel Gabriel comes down to Earth and he has never taken an economics class. And he wants to do something good for mankind and says, you know what I will do is just I simply double the amount of money in existence overnight. <laughs> but I will do absolutely nothing to consumer goods and producer goods. So you wake up in the morning and you find that in your bank account you have $2,000 instead of $1,000. In your wallet you have $100 instead of $50 and so forth. Uh, but the quantity of consumer goods that you own and the quantity of producer goods you own is just the same as before. So then the question is, are you richer? Or is the society as a whole richer as a result of this? And what is the answer? The answer is, of course, not one bit. What happens now? Again, recall what money does. Money purchases these consumer goods and producer goods. So if we have twice as much money, but the consumer goods and producer goods quantities are just the same, what will then happen? The prices, the prices of consumer goods and producer goods will roughly double. I'll come back to why I only say roughly. Um, are we richer as a result of this? The answer is, of course, not at all, not one whit. Um, if the angel Gabriel had done exactly the opposite, he had cut our money in half, but again, he had done nothing to consumer goods and producer goods. Would we then be poor? And the answer is no. Then the prices will fall roughly in half for consumer goods and producer goods, and we are just as rich as we were the day before. So this is the basic insight why, as far as money is concerned, we have to say any quantity of money is as good as any other quantity of money. By increasing the quantity of money, you cannot make a society rich. By the quantity of money falling, societies will not become poor. It is the quantity of consumer goods and producer goods in existence that determines, so to speak, how wealthy or how poor a society is, not the quantity of money. Again, let me just jump ahead a little bit in my presentation and assume for a second, which I have not explained yet, that we have paper money. As you will see later on, paper money is a very miraculous type of invention that cannot come in, into existence just by accident. But as you know, we have nowadays paper money. Originally, we had gold and silver being used as money, uh, but no paper. If it were true that you could make a society richer by increasing the quantity of money under the current system where you can create money out of thin air, Just, all, all you have to do is turn on the printing presses. <laughs> How could you then explain that there is any poor country or any poor person in the world? After all, I can dump millions and millions of dollars on top of you, of paper dollars. Why is China poor? It cannot be because the Chinese do not know how to print you up. <laughs> that is easy as pie. But if they would do it, would the Chinese be all of a sudden rich? And the answer is, no, of course not. You can print any of your, what is your currency called? Yes. Uh, 
Let us. I can help you if you don't know how to do it. I mean, you would have to spell the name right, and then I will print it. Um, and heap any amount of money on top of you, but you would not have one additional consumer good and one additional producer good. You would be just as rich or just as poor as you currently are. <coughs> Nonetheless, again, jumping far ahead of things that I still want to do in other lectures, you all realize what is the solution that the establishment has to a financial crisis. That some things don't work right. We have to increase credit. We have to increase the supply of money. That is just a childish, idiotic idea to do something like this. Very important. Increases in money have absolutely no effect on wealth that exists in societies. However, I have to make two amendments in order to make sure that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. This does not change what I've just said, but clarify certain points. If, as in the old days, we have a commodity money, that is not a pure paper money, but something that is a real commodity, such as gold and silver. If we have an increase in gold and silver, then commodity monies can also be used for non-monetary purposes. That is, with the additional amount of gold and silver, we can turn that into gold coins or silver coins. And insofar as we would do this, it would have no beneficial effect on society as a whole. The quantity of money would increase. That means prices will go up. That's all. But we can also use these additional quantities of gold or silver to do something else. We do not have to use them for monetary purposes. We can also use the gold to fill teeth. We can use the additional gold to make additional earrings and so forth. Insofar as we turn these additional quantities of the money commodity into non-monetary uses, society benefits. More gold means more teeth can be filled, more jewelry can be uh, produced and so forth. Currently, you realize, of course, there is no other purpose of paper money except the monetary purpose. Maybe you can wallpaper your wall with it or something like this. So then you could say, okay, I have one additional wall that I could wallpaper because I put all the dollar notes against the wall. Um, so under the gold standard or under the silver standard, additions to silver and gold can have positive effects. Additions to paper money can have no positive effect whatsoever. Now the second amendment. Now if you realize that increasing the money supply cannot make society as a whole richer, why is it done nonetheless? And now the second amendment is this. While increases in the quantity of money cannot make society as a whole richer, they can make some people richer at the expense of making other people poorer. That is, additional quantities of money can redistribute existing income without being able to increase income for the society as a whole. Now let me explain this. So imagine the angel Gabriel has done what I described before. He has just increased the double the money supply overnight. And now imagine that uh, that two individuals discover this wonderful, great, I'm far richer than I was the day before, but they react differently. The one person <laughs> immediately runs out and spends all of his additional money that he has on various items. And the other person, let's say, decides, okay, I wait for a week, think carefully what I do with all this additional money, and then after a week I will spend my money. Now what happens 
if the person runs out and spends his money immediately to prices. No. Some prices of some goods <coughs> will immediately begin to rise. Those goods on which he spends his additional money. So let's say if I'm a Coca-Cola freak, <laughs> and all my money, additional money I spend now on Coca-Cola. What happens then to Coca-Cola prices? Coca-Cola prices will already rise. The other person waits for a week and then realizes, oh, I'm a Coca-Cola freak, awesome, um, and goes out into the market and spends his money also on Coca-Cola. What will he find? Coca-Cola prices are already higher than they were a week before due to the fact that somebody already spent it earlier than he spent. So who is now better off and who is worse off? The person who spent the money first is better off because he bought at the originally low prices and now as a result of his behavior, prices went up. The person who waited longer is comparatively worse off because he now has to pay already the higher prices for Coca-Cola which result from the fact that the other person did that already a week earlier. Now, now make this a little bit more realistic in order to see what is really going on whenever we have what we call inflation. The quantity of money is increased and who benefits from it. Currently under a pure paper money standard, and I have still not explained how we get there. Cur currently, under a pure paper money standard, who gets the additional quantities of money always first? Look, when the money supply is increased, it, it doesn't shower on all of us at the same time. It's not $100 notes fall down on your head and $100 notes fall down on my head and on your head all at the same time. Who produces money? Who is the only institution that produces money? Central banks. The central banks. So where does the new money always come into existence? At the end of the central bank first. Who gets these additional amounts of money then set after the central bank? Govern government. These are government or the major commercial banks. And who gets this then? from the major commercial bank, the major clients of the major commercial banks. And who gets it typically very late or not at all? Ordinary people. Nor normal people. So what is the consequence of this? The consequence of this is the first people who get the new money first and spend it first benefit gain at the expense of impoverishing people who get the money late or not at all. Look, if there is more money brought into existence, does the salary, for instance, of pensioners go up? The answer is, no, you get to exactly the same. But what is the consequence of more money being brought into existence? Is prices for various goods are all higher. <coughs> So his real income has fallen. You might get still $1,000 a month, but you can buy less for $1,000 a month than you could buy before. So here we have the explanation. Why is it, despite the fact that increases in the quantity of money cannot possibly make society as a whole richer, why is it that we continuously have this phenomenon? And the answer is, some people enrich themselves at the expense of others by doing it. So we can easily discover the motive for inflation. The inflation, inflationary motive is that's the possibility of ripping off other people, making me richer and making other people poor. Then recall, first insight was any quantity of money is equally optimal. Increases in the quantity of money can only redistribute existing income, make some people richer at the expense of others. Now, what 
the second, the, the second important insight. Maybe I should have even made that before. Whatever becomes the common medium of exchange must orig originally have been a valuable commodity traded in barter. It must have been originally a valuable consumer good or producer good and is then selected among all the consumer goods and producer goods for this particular purpose. Why is that? Now imagine, for instance, I, would, I had produced something and, uh, and wanted to get something from you you are not um, you are not interested in the products that I produced or I'm not interested in the products that you produced um, and I came up with the following idea I would say look I I really want your I really want your apples but I have only pears to offer and you obviously don't like pears but instead I'll offer you a piece of paper and I write hundred dollars on it. So I tear that off. And here you have my uh, hundred dollar note. And why don't you give me your apples? What would you then say? You would say you must be crazy. This is a worthless piece of paper, and I have to all have a valuable good to offer. Um, and even if I would decrease my offer, that's okay. I'm generous today. I make it a thousand dollars that I offer you. It would make no difference whatsoever. But what you immediately see is the thing that we all use as money could never come into existence just like this. Somehow, obviously, it came into existence. We have to explain why it came into existence, how it could come into existence. But it can never be at the beginning of the development of money that some people just take a worthless piece of paper and offer that in exchange. You would be you would be considered to be crazy if you were to, would try to do something like this. So instead, everything that is chosen as a common medium of exchange must have been initially what we call a commodity money. Instead of what we have nowadays, what we call a fiat money and made up money. I'll explain how um, this transition, transition occurred. So, next important insight, money must originate as a commodity money. It cannot possibly originate, come into existence in the first place as, um, as a fiat money. Now, what sort of commodity is chosen for money? That has changed in the course of time, in the course of history. Many, many different commodities have been used for the purpose of, uh, of money. There are certain characteristics that the commodity must have that make it more likely or less likely. Uh, obviously, eggs would not be good as money because the purpose of money is acquire it and then use it for a while, then spend it. If eggs would be money, um, you might want to go to the market and you have egg running down your leg. <laughs> that would, would not be a very good thing. It has to be somehow durable. Um, whatever is chosen as money must also be something that can be divided up into smaller and smaller units because you want to buy little things and you want to buy big things. So you must have large quantities and small quantities and by splitting it up, the nature of the thing should not change. Tractors would not be used as money very lightly. Uh, because you cannot chop up a tractor and then sell the steering wheel and then the tires and then the motor and all of this. The nature of the product would be different once you chop it up. But if you have metals, for instance, then you have just a smaller quantity of gold or a larger quantity of gold, but it still remains gold. Um, so it has to be durable, it has to be divisible, it has to be portable. It must be easy to transport the stuff. 
So lead, the most heavy of all metals, would not likely be used as a medium of, as a common medium of exchange and so forth. But many goods, of course, fulfill these requirements to a certain extent. In the old days, in economic textbooks, nowadays it hardly ever exists in textbooks anymore, but in the old days, what they uh, used as an example in order to illustrate what sort of thing becomes a common medium of exchange was the example of prisoners of war camps. So people sit in prisoners' camps, and then they get care packages sent in from the outside world. So then you discover in these packages that you receive some goods you like, you keep, other goods you hate. You, don't, you have personally no use for it. You realize, however, that other people have use for it. Then you have the same problem that I described already before, this double coincidence of wants. You have to find somebody who has what you want, and he wants what you have. Um, and out of this problem, very quickly, what developed as the common medium of exchange in prisoners of war camps was cigarettes. Um, that is, people realized um, that it was a highly marketable good. And even if you were a non-smoker, all you had to do was just getting rid of those things for which you had no personal use, acquire cigarettes for them, and use the cigarettes then in order to purchase whatever, whatever you wanted. Uh, I don't think it would work anymore nowadays, because most people don't even consider cigarettes any good anymore. They might immediately throw it out. Uh, and uh, being health fanatics, maybe it would be bean sprouts or something like that would be used as, uh, as a common medium of exchange. Uh, so certain characteristics help in some goods being selected for this purpose. Next important insight is money has a tendency to become a universal money. That is, the common medium of exchange tends to become a worldwide used medium of exchange. What is the reason for this? Just as different regions start trading with each other, why do different regions trade with each other? For the same reason why you and I trade with each other. It is advantageous. So if in one region they use money A, and in another region they use money B, trading is not as easy as it could be. Because in order to buy something in a region that uses a different money from my own, I would first have to exchange my money for somebody else's money, and then use this money in order to buy something that I want to buy. We are still in a system of partial barter. We cannot trade immediately, but a double coincidence is still necessary. I must have the money that you want, and you must have the money that I want, and then we can trade. So there is a tendency in the market to facilitate exchange on a worldwide level. And we can see what the ultimate solution to this problem is. The entire world uses exactly the same type of commodity as a medium of exchange. That makes exchange then as easy as it can possibly be. And in fact, this is of course what has by and large happened in history. Out of initially all sorts of different commodity monies being used in different regions, as these different regions began to trade with each other, a tendency emerged of one type of money being outcompeted by another one, and at the end only two types of money remained in existence, silver and gold, being used on a worldwide scale. The inside money must begin as a commodity. Money has a tendency of becoming an international commodity money. The third insight, is already the fourth or fifth. Is 
not an economic law, but an economic regularity. If we have a commodity money such as gold or silver, then the tendency was, historically speaking, that the purchasing power of money increased over time. That is, you could buy more for a unit of money. You realize that this is different today. You know exactly that next year you can buy less for a unit of money, and in two years even less, and in three years even less than that. What was the reason for the fact that under the gold standard, for instance, prices generally tended to fall? The reason was this. In modern economies for several hundred years now, the tendency is for, let's say, this rectangle indicates here the quantity of producer and pro consumer goods in existence. So that every year, the size of this rectangle becomes a little bit bigger. The quantity of consumer goods and producer, producer goods increases over time. And these are millions and millions of different goods. On the other hand, let's say this rectangle here indicates a quantity of gold that is used for monetary purposes. You realize that this is used to buy this stuff up. In terms of prices, in terms of records, in terms of, uh, in terms of money. And here we had, as an historical accident, the fact that the quantity of gold in existence, mined and minted, increased teeny amounts from year to year, by very small amounts. This is still true today. Um, so if this rectangle increases quite a bit, again, recall these are millions and millions of different goods, if this increases just a little bit over time, what we, what we then expect to be the case in terms of prices of this expressed in this that the level of prices tends to fall in the course of time. Things get cheaper and cheaper. We know that next year milk will be 95 cents instead of a dollar. In, in two years from now, it will be 93 cents, 92 cents, and so forth. During the second half of the 19th century, roughly speaking, that was a general tendency in almost all developed economies, that prices from year to year fell. I realized it had also an advantage in terms of no wage negotiations had to be done. People noticed by the nominal payment that they receive staying the same, the purchasing power of what they could buy for their salary increased from year to year automatically. Imagine we would have miraculously discovered gold all over the place and it would have been easy as pie to mine the gold. And we would have had something like this. <laughs> what would then have happened to prices? Then prices might have risen. But such a thing has never occurred and it is easy to imagine why that is Difficult that that could ever occur because, after all, the gold has to be found, has to be mined, and all the rest of it. But you have immediately also an idea of, without having explained this transition yet, you have an immediate idea of what is the explanation of the observation that we have nowadays, namely, Prices will not fall from year to year. Prices will be higher from year to year. Everything will be more expensive. The milk will be a dollar now, at a dollar five next year, a dollar ten, and two years from now, a dollar fifteen then, and so forth and so forth. What is the explanation that, despite the fact that this always increases, prices, reckoned in terms of money, always go up? Well, the answer is, of course. Precisely because of this. This one increases, but this one here increases even more. 
And how can this increase even more? Yes, because with gold, it is difficult to imagine that we would just have this magic discovery of additional gold. But with paper money that can be printed, it is, of course, very easy to imagine that the quantity of money increases even faster than the quantity of producer goods and consumer goods that are being produced. Before I come to the explanation of the transition from commodity money to fiat money, a few little insights. Money is not a measure of value. In many textbooks, they say money is a measure of value. Value cannot be measured at all. And money has nothing to do with measuring value at all, which is very easy to understand in a way. Look, here I have money. And money is being exchanged against goods, consumer goods, or producer goods. Does that indicate that there exists some sort of equality between the money and the goods? that I acquire or sell for money? And the answer is, no, there is no equality at all. Whenever an exchange takes place, this expresses an inequality. I exchange my money for a newspaper. That means I must value the newspaper more highly than I value the money. That is the reason why I give the money away and acquire the newspaper. What must be the case for the newspaper vendor? The newspaper vendor must have opposite preference for us. He must value the dollar more than he values the newspaper. That's the reason why he acquires the newspaper, the, the dollar, and gives the newspaper away. Every, in every exchange, Equality of value plays absolutely no role. It is precisely because the goods that are exchanged are evaluated as having unequal value that we have a motive to exchange one for the other. Whatever I acquire must have in my eyes higher value than whatever I give away. So money is not a measure of value. It has absolutely nothing to do with it. Money is just a good that is also valued, just as consumer goods are valued and producer goods are valued, for the service that money does for us, namely allowing us to purchase whatever we want whenever we feel like it. So money is not a measure of value. A great mistake to think that it has anything to do with measuring. Because money is the common medium of exchange, money is used as a unit of account. It is also sometimes given as a second definition of money. And this indeed follows from the definition of money being the common medium of exchange. Your accounting then you do, of course, in terms of money. Again, recall that we can do economic uh, cost accounting. The units that we use for the cost accounting are, of course, money units. So money is a unit of account, which follows from the fact that it is a common medium of exchange. What is false, again, is the idea that money is a store of value, or to regard a store of value as a definition of money. Yes, of course, money must somehow store the value, otherwise nobody would want to have it. If it would lose all of its value, once I acquire it, then I could not use it tomorrow to buy something else. And of course, it has to store the value. But it is not the peculiar function of money to be stored. Money. There might be things that are far better store of value than money. It might be that the value of a house stays more stable in the long run than the, state, than the value of, uh, of a dollar. It is, might not be the best store of value. There might be other things 
that keep their value in a better way than money would do. So money is not a store of a store of value. I should also, because it is also very popular among monetarists of the Friedman types, who somehow think that the purpose of money is to have stable value. By which he means the purchasing power of money should remain the same over time. I should be able to buy the same quantities of goods for a dollar now, and tomorrow, and in one year, and in three years, and so forth. So, first of all, we cannot even define what stable purchasing power of money means. Um, because obviously, all sorts of people buy different things for money. And if one price for one good goes up, and another price for another good goes down, whether this is stable or not depends, is that good important for me? Did the price go up? And do I buy this good? Or is it a good that I don't even care about? And some other good it might have fallen the price, but that's precisely the good that I want to buy all the time. So, what is stable value of money, apart from the fact that it cannot even be defined, it is also easy to see that this is not what we want a stable value of money. If I ask you, do you want the value of your house um, to go up, to go down, or to remain stable? What is your answer? To go up. To, to go up. I mean, I bought it for a thousand dollars. For a hundred thousand dollars, can go, can fall to ninety. It can remain at hundred thousand, and it can also go up to hundred and ten. So the Friedman Knights would then say, somehow there's a particular virtue in the fact that the house price remains at hundred thousand. But every normal person would say, hey, if I get hundred ten thousand, that sounds even better. So for money, of course, the same holds true also. It might be that you can buy less for a unit of money. It might be that you can buy the same for a unit of money. And it can be that you can buy more for a unit of money. Which one of these three alternatives would you prefer? That you can buy more for it. Okay. So the idea that we have to stabilize the value of money is again an idiotic notion. No, no purpose to it. If all prices, and another important side point here, if all prices fall in the economy, as I explained, it was the case under commodity money standard, does that mean that businessmen can no longer make profits? Well, the answer no, it has nothing to do with it. Look, profit is the difference between input prices and output prices. The difference. But if all prices fall, then input prices fall and output prices fall, and the difference is what is of importance for the businessman. There are even now sectors in the economy where prices continuously fall. Where is that the case? For all com you know if you buy a computer one year from now, it will be cheaper than it is today. If you wait five years, you can almost bet your life on the fact that the computer will be still cheaper. Is the computer industry or TV industry or electronics industry, is that an industry that is in particularly bad shape? And the answer is not that I know of. What has happened in these industries is, of course, yes, their output prices, the price for the computer went down. But what also happened was all the ingredients that went into the computer also fell. And the businessmen, being interested in this difference is not affected by that at all. So a falling level of prices does not mean there's a crisis. People can also make profits if the level of prices is falling. Okay, now very quickly at least, I want to indicate the transition to a fiat money. That's it. We must begin with commodity money. How do we have fiat money in existence? 
we have we would expect that money would be an international commodity money how come that what we have instead is national paper currencies and instead of a money that is deflationary where the purchasing power of which increases over time we have a money that is inflationary the purchasing power of money decreases over time how does that happen and the answer is this is the result of deliberate interference of governments or states with money Initially, what you had in existence before governments meddled with these things was something like this. You had competition in mining. You had competition in minting. That is, you had different producers who were mining the commodity, the money commodity. You had different producers who then transformed them into standardized sizes that is engaged in minting. And we had in that world uh, genuine money, that is gold or silver. And we had also what we call money substitutes. Now, what are money substitutes? Money substitutes are tickets titles to money which are accepted as if they were money. That's very easy to explain how that happens. So let's say I deposit money in a bank for safekeeping purposes. I get a deposit ticket that says I deposited such and such amount of money. Then it is possible or conceivable that people might actually accept a piece of paper if they think that this piece of paper is a title to the commodity. They might be too lazy to go to the bank and get the money really out. They say, well, oh, the paper is safer somehow. Um, so I'll simply pay you by paper <coughs> instead of paying you in gold coins. And you are willing to accept the paper because you know th this is a perfectly safe title. All I have to do is just go to the bank and then I get the, get the gold. But uh, I leave the gold in, in the bank right now and simply keep, keep the title. This, by the way, is the only way in which people might ever be willing to accept a piece of paper because the piece of paper is not a piece of paper. Uh, it is a title to a commodity and the title can be redeemed into the real thing at any time that I want. So money exists, people pay in gold and silver, but also money substitutes exist, that is, titles to gold and silver, and they are also circulating, that people accept them also. What has happened is this. The first step was you have to eliminate competition in minting. Government monopolized the minting of the coins. But said, oh, you can only trust me that the weight and the fineness of the silver or gold is certified correctly. As you all know, businessmen only want to defraud people. They are criminals all, so to speak. Um, but governments, of course, can be trusted. Again, recall what, and to see how ridiculous this argument is. What is, imagine there's competition in the field of mining gold, and uh, of minting gold into gold coins, and somebody would misspecify what the amount of gold or the fineness of gold is. What would the implication be? So I produce gold coins, you produce gold coins. But I lie about the content of how much it is and how fine it is. What would you do if you find out that I lied about my gold coins? No. So you would make an advertising campaign. They can't trust this hopeful guy. You'll 
uh, writes all sorts of nonsense on the point. But here I am, I have, of course, certified correctly. And what would happen to me? I would go out of business. What makes a competition in all areas does this sort of thing? It does not prevent that fraud does not occur at all. But the fact that you have people who compete against you is one powerful reason why you don't defraud people, why you don't cheat people. Because it is, yeah, would be an open invitation for your competitors to just point out, look at this guy. He tells you that he uh, sells tuna fish and instead there's cat food in, uh, in the cans. Um, I would be finished. But now imagine that you are the only producer of minted coins. The government is the only one that does it. Does it become more likely or less likely that fraud will be committed? And the answer, of course, it becomes more likely because other people are simply no longer permitted to point out, look, they are defrauding you. What governments did initially, when money was still commodity, money was engaging in coin clipping. They simply reduced the content of the gold. One king dies, the next king comes to power. He says, the other guy looked ugly, but I'm very pretty. I want to put the new face on there. Hand me all over the, your coins. I will melt them down. I will remint them with my beautiful face on it. And then I'll give you the exact same quantity of coins back that you gave initially. Except, of course, that each coin has 10% less gold in it than before. And who gets the 10% additional gold? the king himself, or the government himself. Uh, then the quantity of money has increased by 10%. 10% more coins now in existence. Who benefits from it? The person who gets the new money first, who has extracted the gold content, reduced it. You cannot do that very often. People are stupid by and large, but they are not stupid all the time. Um, you find, eventually you find out that this has happened. You cannot repeat this over and over again without people becoming aware of it. So what must you do next? The next you must do is you monopolize the issue of money substitutes. Before, if I was a banker, I could issue my tickets, the Hopper tickets that certified that I had the gold in the vault and those people who had the title could come to me and get the gold out. He had whatever his Jones, Jones bank and has Jones tickets. Um, and so we have lots of people issuing these money substitutes. And each one thinks he can just present his substitutes and go to the banker who issues these substitutes and get the real thing. Now you realize, of course, that and this is something that all bankers are tempted to do because not all ticket holders come at the same time and want to redeem their tickets into the real thing. What could be the temptation for a bank? Uh, the temptation could be, for instance, to print up additional tickets that look exactly like the other tickets, except there is no gold or no silver in the vault. And he can loan them out and collect interest on that. So there is a temptation of fraud for bankers. What would happen, by the way, if you print up additional titles that look exactly like the other ones? And then all people would come and want to redeem their titles into the real thing. What would then occur? A bank, a bank run, and could the bank withstand the bank run? The answer, no, the bank would then be bankrupt. As well, you realize or leading up a little bit to what I want to explain my lecture on Keynes and tomorrow. We had bank runs right now, even with paper money in existence. But the banks didn't have the damn things. But again, if you have competition in the issue of money substitutes, then it is very difficult to give in to this temptation to engage in fraudulent activities. Why? Because as soon as I discover that in her bank she issued additional tickets, all I have to do is then just announce this. Look, her bank is actually bankrupt. And then you will have a bank run, 
And the bankrupt would reveal whether you are bankrupt or not bankrupt. And because everybody realizes that that can happen, they will be very careful not engaging in activities such as this. So now imagine that the government says, no, no, no bank can issue any money substitutes on their own anymore. The only one that can issue money substitutes is me. These dollar notes, or euro, euro at that time exist, German marks, or whatever it was, all of them were initially nothing else but paper titles to a certain quantity of gold. Now the government says, I'm only the only one that can print these dollar notes. Nobody else can do it. What will they do? They print additional notes up more easily than if there were competition in this field. Because nobody can point out what they are up to. As a matter of fact, all governments made it then illegal to incite bankrupts. But nobody has to be afraid of a bankrupt if, in fact, they have some money. You only have to be afraid of bankruptcy if you are a crook. So government outlawed people standing in the corner and saying, oh, the governments are all bankrupt. Because they knew that, in fact, they were bankrupt. So then you had bankrupts occurring nonetheless. Governments couldn't pay. They didn't have enough gold or silver in order to redeem all the notes. And what did they then do? Then they went off the gold standard or off the silver standard, whatever it was. Then one day they simply said, look, you guys, keep your paper. And we, the government, keeps the gold that was initially the gold of the public that had been deposited in banks. In the United States, that occurred in 1933, going off the gold standard. Up, up until that point, $35 of these greenbacks of this paper entitled you to one ounce of gold. And then people realized, of course, hey, these guys don't have enough gold in order to redeem all the paper. Bank runs occurred, they couldn't pay. And then, okay, we keep the gold, you can keep, you can keep the paper. So by an outright fraud, commodity monies were subverted and replaced by fiat money. And then this remark. Then we have the following situation. Nowadays, there exists no currency in the world that is redeemable into anything. This is, whenever you turn in your dollar notes or uh, euro notes, all you get is just freshly printed ones. So if they are wrinkly, and then you turn them in. They, of course, we redeem that. We give you a fresh one. You give me the old one, and I give you a new one. But you don't get anything for it. And now imagine this, the following scenario. Imagine I would make you the only producer of euros in Europe. <laughs> only you can produce euros. Everybody else who produces euros is a counterfeiter, is a criminal. Can't do that. What would then happen? You know you can print euros. Nobody else can print euros. Everybody else trying to go into competition is just a criminal. What will you then do? And the answer, if you are not an angel, <laughs> then you will likely produce euros. And to produce a one euro note doesn't cost you any less than it to produce a thousand uh, Euro note. The printing costs are basically the same. Uh, maybe it's even less because you have more zeros. You can just somehow save on the, on the uh, paint there. Um, so you can print it up by yourself in Mercedes. Um, would you do that? Yes. Of course. Who wouldn't? Um, and then you discover you had more friends than you ever thought. <laughs> they all come to you and want your help. 
was a, a new, nice, nice new house would be great for me. My girlfriend eats this, my boyfriend eats that, and all the, can't you help me? And they become then your advisors. So all central banks have, of course, thousands of smart people, econ <laughs> mostly economists, who just try to just persuade you that what they do is beneficial to you. Um, after all, they realize without this cushy job that they have, they might, they might really have to work somewhere. Maybe they have a gas pump operation or something <laughs> of that nature. Um, and of course, they have to fool you. They have to make you believe that these people do actually something valuable. But as I explained, no increase in the money supply can ever make a society um, better off. And that's what central banks do and do nothing else but increasing the money supply. That's their sole purpose. Governments have two institutions that are of utmost importance for them. Their income comes, on the one hand, from taxes. They don't produce anything and sell it in the market. So taxes. And you need tax collectors. The tax collectors are typically the people, the KGB type looking guys with leather coats and the big people put, push them on the ground and pick their teeth up and things like this. And then, and then you have the fancy division, even far more important, the counterfeiting division. And the head of the counterfeiting division are people like Greenspan and Bernanke and Touche and what, I don't know what, what your guys uh, is called. Um, they run around, of course, in suits um, and are treated with great respect. <laughs> but nonetheless, this is what they are. They are the heads of the counterfeit division of the government. And without the counterfeit division of the government, the government would be worse than us. Okay. So with this, I can... Uh, um, I'll, I'll stop now. We'll take, take a little break and then we'll go.